Chapter 2 I'm on my hands and knees in the doorway to Mr. Cullen's office, and gentle hands are around me helping to pull me up. I am so embarrassed. Damn my clumsiness. I have to steal myself to glance up. Holy crow, he's so young. Uh, Miss Hale, he extends a long-fingered hand to me once I'm stood. I'm Edward Cullen. Are you alright? Would you like to sit? He's so young and attractive. Very attractive. Tall, dressed in a fine gray suit, white shirt, and black tie with unruly bronze hair and intense bright green eyes that regard me shrewdly. Er, uh, actually, it takes a moment for me to find my voice, and I think my mouth has plopped open in astonishment. This guy is over 30, then I'm a monkey's uncle. I extend my hand to him in daze, and we shake. As our fingers touch, I feel a strange current go through me. I withdraw my hand hastily, and I can feel myself blinking rapidly, matching my heart rate. Miss Hale is er, indisposed, so she sent me. Uh, I hope you don't mind, Mr. Cullen. And you are? His voice is warm, possibly amused, but it's difficult to tell from his impassive expression. He looks mildly interested, but above all, polite. Isabel Swan, I'm uh, studying English with Rose or er, Rosalie or er, Miss Hale at Washington State. I see, he says simply, and I think I can see the ghost of a smile in his expression, but I'm not sure. Would you like to sit? He waves me towards a white leather but an L-shaped couch. The room is vast with an enormous modern dark wood a desk besides the floor to ceiling windows. Everything is white except on the wall by the door. There's a succession of small square paintings, 36 of them arranged in a square. Uh, they are exquisite. A series of mundane, forgotten objects painted in such precise detail they look like photographs. Displayed together, they are breathtaking. A uh, local artist, Troughton, he says when he catches my gaze. They're lovely, raising the ordinary to extraordinary, I murmur, distracted by him and by the paintings. He gazes at me intently. Uh, yes, Miss Swan, he replies softly. Apart from the painting, the rest of the room is pleasant enough, but it's quite cold. Clean. Clinical. I wonder if it truly reflects the personality of the Greek god who sinks gracefully into one of the white leather chairs opposite me. I am disturbed by where my thoughts are heading, so I busy myself with finding the questions that Rose has given me, and then setting up the mini-disc recorder. I am all fingers and thumbs, dropping it twice on the dark wood coffee table in front of me. Mr. Collins says nothing, as I become increasingly embarrassed and flustered. When I finally pluck up the courage to look at him, he is watching me, one hand relaxed in his lap and the other cupping his chin and trailing his long index finger across his lips. I I think he's trying to suppress a smile. Uh, sorry, I stutter. I'm not used to this. Take all the time you need, Miss Swan, he says. Do you mind if I record your answers? After you've taken so much trouble to set the recorder, you ask me now? I flush. He's teasing me. I hope. I blink at him, and I think he takes pity on me because he relents. No, I don't mind. Did Rose, I mean Miss Hale, explain what the interview was for? 
Yes, your student newspaper, WSU Eyewitness, to appear in the graduation issue, as I shall be conferring the degrees at this year's graduation ceremony. Oh, this is new to me. And I'm temporarily preoccupied with the thought that someone not much older than me, okay, maybe six years or so, and okay, he's mega successful, but still, he's going to present me with my degree. I try and drag myself back to the task in hand. Good. Well, I have some questions, Mr. Cullen. I smooth a stray lock of hair behind my ear. I thought you might, he says, deadpanned. He's teasing me again. I feel the heat in my cheeks, and I pull myself up in an attempt to look taller and tempting. I press the start button on the recorder and try for professional. I read the first of Rose's questions. You're very young to have amassed such an empire. To what do you owe your success? I glance up at him. He smiles ruefully at me, but looks vaguely disappointed. Business is all about people, Miss Swan, and I'm very good at judging people. I know how they tick, what makes them flourish, what weakens them, what inspires them, and how to incentivize them. I employ many, many good people, and I reward them well. I believe that the road to success in any scheme is to make oneself master of that scheme, and I work hard, very hard, to do that. Uh, I make decisions based on logic and facts, and I have good solid ideas and an exceptional team that can come up with good solid ideas. Again, good people. Maybe you're just lucky. This isn't on Rose's list, but he's so arrogant. I don't subscribe to luck or chance, Miss Swan. The harder I work, the more luck I seem to have. It really is all about having the right people on your team. I think it was Harvey Firestone who said the growth and development of people is the highest calling of leadership. You sound like a control freak. The words are out of my mouth before I can stop them. Oh, I exercise control in all things, Miss Swan, he says, not a trace of humor in a smile. I look at him and he holds my gaze steadily and passive, but my heartbeat quickens inexplicably and my face flushes again. Why does he have such an unnerving effect on me? His overwhelming good looks, maybe? The way his eyes blaze at me? He continues. Besides, immense power is acquired by assuring yourself in your secret reveries that you were born to control things. Do you feel that you have immense power? Control freak. I employ over 50,000 people in this one. That gives me a certain sense of responsibility. Power, if you will. If I decide I'm no longer interested in the telecommunications business and sell up, 25,000 people would struggle to make their mortgage payments after a month or so. I think my mouth drops open. I am staggered by his lack of humility. Don't you have a board to answer to? I ask, disgusted. I own my company, so I don't have to answer to a board. He raises an eyebrow at me. Of course I would know this if I had done some research, but holy crow. He's so arrogant, I change tack. And do you have any interests outside of your work? I have varied interests, Miss Swan. A ghost of a smile touches his lips. Very varied. And for some reason I feel confounded and heated by his steady gaze his eyes alight with some wicked thought. But if you worked so hard, what do you do to chill out? Chill out? He smiles a dazzling white tooth crooked smile at me. I stop breathing. He really is beautiful. No one should be this good looking. Well, to chill out, as you put it, I sail, I fly, various uh, physical pursuits. 
He shifts in his chair. I'm a very wealthy man, Miss Swan, and I have expensive and absorbing hobbies. I glance quickly at Rose's questions, wanting to get off this, this subject. You invest in manufacturing. Why specifically, I ask. Why does he make me feel so uncomfortable? I like to build things. I like to know how things work, what makes things tick, how to construct and deconstruct, and I have a love of ships. What can I say? That sounds like your heart talking rather than logic and facts. His mouth quirks up at me and he stares at me appraisingly. Possibly, though there are people I know who'd say I don't have a heart. Why would they say that? Because they know me well. His lip curls in a wry smile. Would your friends say that you are easy to get to know? And I regret the question as soon as I say it. It's not on Rose's list. I'm a very private person, Miss Swan, and I'll go a long way to protect my privacy. I don't often give interviews, he trails off. Why do you agree to do this interview? Because I'm a benefactor of the university, and to all intents and purposes, I can get Miss Hale off my back. She badgered and badgered my PR people, and I admire that kind of tenacity. I knew just how tenacious Rose could be. That's why I was sat here squirming uncomfortably, when I should be revising. You also invest in farming technologies. Why are you interested in this area? We can't eat money, Miss Swan, and there are too many people on this planet who don't have enough to eat. That sounds very philanthropic. Is that something you feel passionately about? Feeding the world's poor? He shrugs. It's shrewd business, he murmurs. Though I think he's being disingenuous. It doesn't make sense. Feeding the world's poor, I can't see the financial benefits of this. Only the virtue of the ideal. I glance at the next question, confused by his attitude. Do you have a philosophy? If so, what is it? I don't have a philosophy as such, maybe a guiding principle, Carnegie's. A man who acquires the ability to take full possession of his own mind may take possession of anything else to which he is justly entitled. I'm very singular, driven. I like control of myself and those around me. So you want to possess things? You are a control freak. I want to deserve to possess them, but yes, bottom line. I do. You sound like the ultimate consumer. I am, he smiles, but the smile doesn't touch his eyes. Again, this is at odds with someone who wants to feed the world, so I can't help but think that we are talking about something else. But I'm absolutely mystified as to what it is. I swallow hard. The temperature in the room feels like it's rising. Or maybe it's just me. I'm nearly through all the questions. Surely Rose has enough material now. I glance at the next question. You were adopted. How far do you think that's shaped the way you are? Oh, this is personal. I stare at him, hoping I haven't offended him. He frowns at me slightly. I have no way of knowing. My interest is piqued. Uh, how old were you when you were adopted? This is all a matter of public record, Miss Swan. His tone is stern. I flush. Yes, of course. If I'd known what I was doing the interview, I would have done some research. I move on. You've had to sacrifice a family life for your work. That's not a question. He's terse. Sorry, I squirm, and he's made me feel like an errant child. Have you had to sacrifice a family life for your work? I try again. I have a family. I have a brother and a sister and two loving parents. I'm not interested in extending my family beyond that. Are you gay, Mr. Cullen? I hear his sharp intake of breath. 
and I cringe immortally. Crap, why didn't I employ some kind of filter before I read this straight out? How can I tell them I'm just reading the questions? Damn, Rose and her curiosity. No, Isabella, I'm not. And he raises his eyebrows, a cool gleam in his eyes. He does not look pleased. I apologize. It's er written here. It's the first time he's said my name and my herpy has accelerated and I can feel my cheeks heating up again. Nervously, I tuck my hair behind my ear as it squirked its way loose. He cocks his head to one side. These aren't your questions? Uh, no, Rose. Miss Hale. She's compiled the questions. Are you colleagues on the student paper? Oh crap, I have nothing to do with the student paper. It's her extracurricular activity, not mine. I can feel my face eating further. No, she's my roommate. He rubs his chin in quiet deliberation, his green eyes appraising me. Did you volunteer to do this interview? He asks quietly. Hang on, who's supposed to be interviewing who? His eyes burn into me and I'm compelled to answer truthfully. I was drafted. She's not well, I say weakly by way of explanation. That explains a great deal, he says softly. There's a knock at the door and blonde number two enters. Mr. Colin, uh, forgive me for interrupting, but your next meeting is in two minutes. We're not finished here, Angela. Please cancel my next meeting. Angela hesitates, staring at him. She's momentarily lost. He raises his eyebrows at her. She flushes. Very well, Mr. Cullen, she mutters and then exits. He frowns and then turns his attention back to me. Where were we, Miss Swan? Oh, we're back to Miss Swan now. Er, uh, please don't let me keep you from anything. I want to know about you, Miss Swan. I think that's only fair. His green eyes light with curiosity. Oh crap, where is he going with this? He places his elbows on the arms of the chair and steeples his fingers in front of his mouth. His mouth is very distracting. There's not much to know, I say, flushing again. What are your plans after you graduate? I shrug, flustered. Come to Seattle with Rose, find a place, find a job. I haven't really thought beyond my finals. I haven't made any plans, Mr. Colin. I just need to get through my final exams, which I should be studying for now rather than sitting in your palatial, swanky, sterile office feeling uncomfortable under your penetra penetrating gaze. We run an internship program here, he says quietly. I raise my eyebrows in surprise. Is he offering me a job? Oh, uh, bear that in mind, I murmur, completely thrown. Though I'm not sure I'd fit in here. Crap, I am using out loud again. Why do you say that? He cocks his head to one side, intrigued. A hint of his crooked smile plays on his lips. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? I'm uncoordinated, scruffy, and I'm not blonde. Not to me, he murmurs, and he gazes at me intently. All humor gone, and strange muscles deep in my belly clench suddenly. I tear my eyes away from the scrutiny and stare down at my knotted fingers. What's going on? I have to go. Now, I lean forward to retrieve the recorder. Would you like me to show you around, he asks. I'm sure you're far too busy, Mr. Colin, and I do have a long drive. You're driving back to Portland? He sounds surprised, anxious suddenly. He glances out of the window, and it's begun to rain. Well, you'd better drive carefully. His tone is stern, authoritative. Why should he care? Did you get everything you need? He adds. 
Uh, yes, sir, I reply, and I pack the recorder into my satchel. His eyes narrow slightly, speculatively. Thank you for letting me interview you, Mr. Cullen. Uh, the pleasure has been all mine. As I rise, he stands and holds his hand out to me. Until we meet again, Miss Swan, and it sounds like a challenge, or a threat. I shake his hand briefly, feeling again the odd current between us. I conclude it must just be my nerves. Mr. Cullen, I nod at him. He moves gracefully to the door and opens it wide. I'm just ensuring you make it through the door, Miss Swan. Obviously, he is referring to my less than elegant entry into his office earlier. I flush. Well, that's very considerate. I snap at him and he smiles. I'm glad you found me amusing. I glower inwardly. I walk into the foyer and he follows. Angela and Jessica both look up in surprise. Did you have a coat? He asks. Yes. Jessica leaps up and retrieves my pea coat, which Colin takes from her before she can hand it to me. He holds it up and feeling beyond self-conscious, I put my arms into it and he puts his hands very briefly on my shoulders as he pulls it over me. I gasp at the contact. If he notices, he gives nothing away. He presses the lift door and we stand there for a beat awkwardly on my part, self-possessed and cool on his. The door is open and I hurry in, desperate to escape. I really need to get out of here. I turn to look at him and he's leaning against the doorway beside the lift. One hand on the wall. He is very, very good looking. It's distracting. His burning green eyes gaze at me. Isabella, he says as a farewell. Edward, I reply, and mercifully, the doors close.